Hi, y'all. I'm Nathan Lincoln, an SRE at Honeycomb, and I'm here to talk to y'all today about some work that we did recently on revamping feature flags at Honeycomb. First, let's ask, what are feature flags? Feature flags are a very specific type of service configuration. Typically, they're very basic true-false values, such as execute this new code or execute the old thing. You can see that in the example graph that I have here. This is a graph of the percentage rollout of our new parameterized boards feature that released on April 4th. You can see that we had opted in some internal and beta teams before the launch date, but at roughly 1,700 hours UTC, the feature went live for everyone. Feature flags let you decouple your deploys from your releases, letting you opt internal users into a feature before it goes fully live and even be able to instantly roll back beta features if they're causing problems for the system. On April 21st, we had a small incident that was causing intermittent errors in our ingest service. We tracked it down to a beta feature that we were testing and were able to instantly turn it off, solving the incident without needing to deploy code changes. Even though feature flags are just configuration at the end of the day, the domain has a surprising amount of complexity, such as serve true for this user, but false for all others, or even serve true for 10% of this segment of users. To make this manageable, a lot of vendors have popped up in the space. Some examples are LaunchDarkly and Split.io. Be it Honeycomb, use and love LaunchDarkly. Because feature flags are a type of configuration, it's totally possible to use them in some novel ways. Some of them are beneficial, and some should maybe be avoided. Before we talk about those, I want to talk about the reason we started this whole project at Honeycomb, and that is the encode defaults of feature flags. If we ever have issues connecting to LaunchDarkly, either because we're having network issues or they're having some level of outage or really anything in between, we'll fall back to an encode default value instead. It's important to note that this problem exists for every feature flag provider. In cases where you have issues connecting to your provider, you need to have some fallback defined. For a provider like Split.io, for instance, this is called the control treatment, but the concept is the same. It's important to be mindful of what value you're using. In the worst case, we might end up accidentally rolling back features that our customers depend on. We noticed that there were several feature flags in our code base that had somewhat dangerous encode defaults. One advantage that we had on this project is that all of our feature flags and their defaults are collected in one centralized place in our code base. This made it especially easy to see where feature flags were used and what their default values would be. Now, let's talk about some of the novel ways that we found to use feature flags. The first novel use is teams using feature flags as a form of account level settings. We had instances of feature flags being used to bump the limits of some things on an account by account basis, taking advantage of the built in targeting features that LaunchDarkly has. This worried us on the SRE team because these are feature flags that are especially hard to keep the defaults correct for, leaving us especially vulnerable in the face of an outage of our provider. The other novel use case, and one that we like a lot more, is called control rods. Control rods is a name that we stole from nuclear reactors, where giant rods are used to control the balance of reactivity and power output. In our lingo, this means that some feature flag is able to adjust the runtime behavior of a component in some way. Maybe it can be as simple as turning a feature off in extreme emergencies. Others are a bit more subtle, such as having a minute-by-minute -minute cron do less work each minute, load shedding so that we can keep operating at a degraded state while we fix the system. Here, we have an example of the value of one of our control rods during an incident on October 3rd of last year. Here, SLO evaluations were overloading the system, so we effectively turned them off for about an hour so that we could focus on fixing other parts of the system. Once things healed, we were able to gradually reintroduce SLO evaluation, showing that our fixes worked. If we hadn't had this control rod, we would have had to turn off even larger portions of the system in an attempt to bring things back under control, and we wouldn't have had the ability to gradually reintroduce the functionality in a safe way. We knew control rods existed, but we had a hard time raising awareness about them, both in terms of finding existing control rods during an incident and getting teams to create new ones. We elected to address both head-on in this project. Now, this is a discussion of feature flag revamping, which implies some corrective action. So it's worth asking, why did we do this and where did we start? As I said before, we started because we became aware that some of the encode defaults for our feature flags were a little dangerous. This meant that if our feature flag vendor ever had downtime, we'd end up using the default values we had to find in code, potentially rolling back features. However, as we started digging in, we realized that there were other issues that we might want to correct. For example, we noticed that many feature flags didn't really have definite owners, and we wanted to correct that problem as well. In the end, what started as make the encode defaults correct ended up as a project with four main goals. Better encode defaults, obviously, getting rid of deprecated feature flags, assigning feature flags to teams to maintain, and finally, making our control rods more discoverable. How do we do this? At first, I was going to try and automate the process as much as possible. With an API in hand, I was writing some scripts that would go through all of our feature flags and apply some rules to them. 
Here we have a SQL query that I was writing to attempt to determine what the current variation is for a launch Starkly feature flag. Due to some peculiarities in the launch Starkly API, this turned out to be a very difficult task to do with SQL alone. In the end, however, I kind of give up on those plans. With 178 feature flags in our inventory, it just proved too much complexity to deal with all at once. What worked well, however, was taking all of our feature flags and putting them into a flexible spreadsheet, which my automation did help with a little bit. I went down the list one afternoon and did all the categorization from assigning a team to determining whether the encode default needed changing, determining if the feature flag can just be deleted, and also asking whether the feature flag qualified as a control rod. Armed with the results of the spreadsheet, I did write a bit of automation to do the tedious work of tagging all feature flags. This automation eventually morphed into a much more complete set of automation, a script that checks the feature flags in our account against a set of rules and notifies the user if some changes are needed. However, it was only after we had done the tedious work of categorization and doing the initial cleanup that this became feasible. Since I understood what things were needed and what things to watch out for, it became much easier to automate the task. Even today, though, this automation isn't really hooked up to anything. As part of the recurring work our team does, we run the tool and take a look at its output. It makes no changes, and the report doesn't automatically go anywhere. This keeps the human in the loop so that we can filter the results through our broader knowledge of the system. Eventually, we might put enough smarts into this tool to make decisions on our behalf, but for now, it's something that merely complements the human as a first step. We come now to the reason that we started this whole project, actually changing the encode defaults of our feature flags. Here we kind of had a dilemma. Do we change the defaults ourselves, or do we assign work to teams to change their defaults? On the one hand, if we ask teams to change the defaults themselves, then we're kind of burdening them with more work. Even though it seems insignificant, we had recently come off a huge project where we identified scaling bottlenecks that we expect to hit over the next year and asked teams to address them. We felt that giving teams more work might strain the relationship they have with us on the SRE team. On the other hand, however, while doing it ourselves does place additional burden on our team, it's time that we have allocated anyways and might create some goodwill while we're at it. So we made one PR per team, changed them the defaults for the flags when we felt it was necessary. Most received a stamp and were merged without fanfare. Others took a bit of back and forth, but none were particularly frustrating. So we've done a bit of spring cleaning, but how do we keep our house in order? In the end, we decided to keep things flexible and leverage the existing embedding relationships that we had with product teams. Each SRE embeds on a product engineering team, and this gives us a convenient and unstructured way to notify teams of, what, of things that we'd like for them to address. In the end, we came away with five main practices that we recommend that teams adopt. First, please tag feature flags with team names. This helps assign ownership and kind of makes things easier on the SRE team. Two, try to keep the encode defaults of feature flags up to date. In the case of a very long-lived feature flag for a big product launch, put a task in the GA milestone to change the default. Three, please avoid using feature flags as team level settings. These are especially difficult to keep the encode defaults up to date for. Fourth, please create more control rods. We absolutely love these and we wanted to raise awareness of them through this work. Finally, when you create a feature flag, simultaneously create the ticket to clean it up. This creates the persistent reminder of the work to be done and allows the cleanup to be done by anyone on the team. And that's where we're at today. After a project to do the cleanup, as well as some brainstorming, we're at a place where we're still not perfect, but we at least have some recommendations to give teams, as well as a tiny bit of automation to make our lives easier. This isn't perfect, but we're in a much better place than we were. One important thing to consider when working on a project like this is that things are going to work differently for every organization. At several points, we had to take into consideration the existing work that we already had in flight into account, but we were able to leverage the existing relationships we had with teams in order to make our lives better. Before attempting a project like this at your org, take some time to do the complicated human work of figuring out what context you're in. It'll set you up for success and make your life easier along the way.